Hello, STEM Nation. Jeff here, and welcome to episode number 10 of STEM on Fire, where we interview practicing professionals in the area of science, technology, engineering, and math. Let's first start by thanking you, our listener, for making this podcast a success. If you're getting value from this podcast, I ask that you share it with a friend so they can also receive value from this podcast. Now let's thank our sponsor, Audible, who is offering a free audiobook. Just head over to stemonfirebook.com. That's stemonfirebook.com to get your free audiobook. Now let's get fired up today with our guest, Teresa, and I hope our chat will help ignite your passion towards a STEM career. Teresa Hutton holds a master's in electrical engineering from Marquette University. She started out as a software engineer at Motorola and is currently a project manager at Johnson Controls, working with Scrum teams. Welcome to the show, Teresa. Fill any gaps and share a bit of your personal life. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so excited to be here with STEM Nation. Before I started full-time at Motorola, I interned with Motorola for two summers. And before that, I interned with AC Rochester, which is a division of General Motors, for two summers. And I also had a seasonal position at Six Flags Great America in their technical services department. And for me, interning and having summer jobs really allowed me to explore different engineering aspects and decide where I wanted to go, as well as it gave me a sense of what it was like to work with a team and in a company. Awesome. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, interning uh, STEM Nation, that's very important. It gives you insights into what's out there before you graduate. So if you do want to diverge and go a different path, you know, you got time to do that. So thanks for that, Teresa. So you're, you've got a master's in electrical engineering, but it seems like you've been focused on software. So can you give some examples of career opportunities for somebody going for electrical engineering, but maybe thinking software? Can you help with that? Sure. So whenever I tell somebody I have um, a degree in electrical engineering, I follow it up and say, but don't think that I know how to design circuits. And even though that's a huge part of electrical engineering, electrical circuit design, uh, there are so many different aspects to electrical engineering. And one of the aspects that I was interested in was image processing. And in order to implement the concepts of image processing, I had to do that in software. So while I don't have a software engineering degree, I don't have a computer science degree, I use software as a tool to implement concepts from electrical engineering. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of electrical engineers that, that they really, all they do is software, and a lot of it can be low-level software. And I think if you're looking at doing high-level applications, like maybe doing apps for iPhones and Androids, you know, there's software engineering, and I think there's also just straight software degrees where it's not the engineering side of things. Do you have any insights into that, Teresa? So I would say if you're looking to do apps, Uh, You might want to look into a computer science degree. If you're looking to write lower level firmware or software, uh, things that maybe control the operating system or control communications, then maybe you want to look into a computer engineering degree or an electrical engineering degree so you can understand how the microprocessor and the different electronic parts work together and you can write your software accordingly. When you get a little higher, then you can use uh, your software engineering or your computer science degree to write software for applications. All right, so let's let's dig into what you specifically do with Johnson Controls as you manage, I'll say, scrum groups. If you can explain what that is and, and delve into that and give us some insights into that uh, profession. Sure, let me give you some history. So as we've said, I've, I did a lot of software engineering and I did that Uh, with image processing and machine vision. And after some time, I was on a development team and I was asked to give some status for the team, which I did. And then I was asked, hey, can you work with the team to develop a plan and a schedule? And I said, sure. And then I gave some more status. And what do you know? I found myself doing project management. And I did that for several years, and I had to decide at some point, do I want to be a project manager or do I want to continue in the technical world? And so I chose project management. And after a few years of doing that, I found out that what I really loved about project management was 
working with the people, working with the teams, ironing out issues across teams, encouraging people to do their best work. And what I found was that's really applicable to what a scrum master does. And a scrum master is a role within a scrum team. Scrum is an agile software development methodology, which encourages teams to be reactive or be able to react to changing requirements. So it's a process uh, that we use. And so as scrum master, what I do is I clear roadblocks for the team. I also encourage people to use the Scrum process, and I teach people how to use it. And I also try and create an environment where the team can be as productive and efficient as possible. Okay, thanks for those insights, Teresa. And the, the Agile, the Scrum environment, if you're not familiar with that, if you're looking at going into the software world, that's becoming more and more uh, valuable. I see that showing up in a lot of the companies that I interface with. So that's an important, uh, important item to pick up, hopefully, in college. So, Teresa, are you involved in any of the hiring processes uh, within JCI? I do interview quite a few candidates, so that's the level that I'm involved with. And do you see, what do you typically look for? Do you look for software engineers? Do you look for computer science or electrical engineers? Or what do you look for uh, in, the, at, in the, the skill set for somebody coming in? So in my particular role, I am now involved with a server UI team. So it's quite a bit different than the embedded software that I grew up with, really. Uh, so what we look for are people who can work within the Scrum methodology, which means that you're okay with reporting your status every day. You're willing to learn new things. Uh, that is key. If, if you can't learn new things or you're not willing to uh, learn about new technology and what's going on out there, then you're really not a good fit for our team. Teresa, the topic of lifelong learning has come up on other podcasts. So I'll say it again, Stemnation, if you think that you're going to have the knowledge you need after graduating four years, Without a continuous learning aspect to your career, you're going to be sadly mistaken. So, Teresa, let's get fired up here. What is one thing that really has you fired up about electrical engineering or software engineering, and where do you think it's headed? So, technology-wise, uh, I see that sensors are producing more and more data and we're gonna be able to use that to predict problems. And there's quite a bit of predictive analysis already going on, but I think this is gonna expand into areas we've never even thought of before. And from a leadership standpoint, I'm excited about the idea of intent-based or hands-off leadership. And when we can provide a clear vision, a clear organizational goals, and we can make sure that our team has the technical competence it needs, then we can start pushing decision-making down to where the information is. And that's just going to make our teams more productive, more efficient, because we don't have just one person thinking. We've got a whole team of people thinking. So you marry those two together, and we have quite a bright future ahead of us. Awesome. And if you're interested in that, uh, go check out episode nine with Brett, which was last week. Uh, he's an industrial engineer that's focused on data analytics. So you may want to listen to that one to get some insights from him. So Teresa, we're going to change gears here a bit, moving into a story, an aha moment you've had, something that might help our STEM nation. Can you take us to a moment in time of an incredible aha moment you've had at work or your personal life and tell us a story and how you turn that aha moment into success. If it's okay with you, Jeff, I'm going to share two aha moments. And the Absolutely. first one... Absolutely. You can share two. <laughs> the first one was external. So when I was in college, I was coming out of one of my electronic lab classes, and a teaching assistant stopped me and said, Teresa, I think you would be a good candidate for a master's degree program. And up to that point, I hadn't really considered this. But it was sort of an aha moment in that at that point, I did consider it and I ended up enrolling and I ended up taking classes which were of interest to me. So I studied signal processing and image processing, control theory. And because I studied those classes, that really set the stage for my career. 
The second aha moment I had came later in my career, and I was conversing with a colleague, and I was asking, how can I get the team more engaged? And he suggested that I read a book called Game Storming. He had been recommended this book to read because he was a coach of a first robotics team. And I read the book and I absolutely loved the content. And my aha moment was when I realized I had to share this information. I had to share the information. And so even though I didn't have a background in public speaking, I really had no interest in that. Uh, I volunteered to give a presentation at our local PMI chapter. PMI is Project Management Institute. I was a project manager at the time, and they gave me this opportunity. And so I worked and worked and worked on this presentation. I even did a practice presentation. I wanted it to go super well. I gave the presentation and it went okay. The material was solid, but I was a little bit nervous about giving the presentation and that showed through in, in my presentation itself. And so instead of beating myself up about that, I used it as a baseline and I decided I was going to improve my public speaking skills. And I did that through joining Toastmasters. Toastmasters is an international organization devoted to helping people improve their public speaking and leadership skills. And we do that through local clubs. And if you're interested in this, go to toastmasters.org and do find a club. There's probably one near you. But given this experience and the training I have in Toastmasters, I'm finding my voice. I'm gaining skills. I've been able to present my game storming to the PMI chapter in Minnesota. I went to the Junior League of Racine and did some game storming with them. I branched out into leadership. I've done leadership presentations for our engineering management team at work, as well as several teams. And I was able to present an educational session at one of the Toastmasters district conventions. So it's really satisfying to be able to share that information. That's that's awesome, Teresa. And I think that goes back to your comment of lifelong learning. So I'll interject with this and say that lifelong learning, it's not just all learning technical, it's the soft skills too. It's how to do public speaking, how to, how to eliminate your fears and talk in front of an audience. Because if you have a great idea, like Teresa is saying, where you know she wanted to share it and she went out and was like, whoa, wow, I, I need to go and improve my presentation skills. Because if you have a great idea, but you can't convey that information to your audience, your ideas really aren't going to go anywhere. So thank you for that, Teresa. We're going to transition now into a topic that's front and center on STEM Nation, and it's getting through college. So Teresa, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 18-year-old self as you're heading off to college? Some things that you wish you knew back then, or even knew back then, that would help our STEMers launch into college successfully. Of course, you have to have great study skills. That goes without saying. But the advice I wish I had was just learn to be comfortable in your own skin. Know it's okay to be smart and still be able to respect the skills people have that are different than your own. So be humble, but know it's okay to have the gifts that you have. Uh, also know that you're doing the best with the knowledge and the tools that you have. So the decisions you're making today, those are the best decisions you can make. And maybe in the future, when you get more tools in your toolbox, you'll make different decisions. Those are also the best decisions you can make at this point in time. So just have a little grace with yourself when you look back on decisions that you've made. And the last thing is really just to take the high road. Your words and your actions can breathe life into others or they can take that life away. So be intentional and look to encourage others because I really truly believe in doing so, you'll be encouraged yourself. You know, you brought up something that I think is very important is being humble. Um, a lot of engineers, you know, they're very proud and they want their ideas to, to go someplace. But if you come into a group and let's say in these uh, agile scrum teams, and you're humble and you're open to other ideas, you'll be able to create much better solutions than if you're very proud of what you have to offer. If you go back and listen to the VP of Engineering, Joe Pfaff from Husco, he brought up humble and he's humble. And that just allows you to succeed further than you could imagine. So Teresa, let's turn our attention into what skills or attributes you think are needed for STEMers to be successful as they transition from college into their careers. So when you 
graduate from college and you make your way into a career, you have to know that there's no longer a curriculum. There's no, no one telling you what to learn. There's no agenda. So you need to dig in. You need to become curious and passionate about whatever area you are entering into. So take the time, learn the new things that you need to learn, even if this means you have to do it outside of work. So just continue learning or start learning whatever you need to know because you need to push yourself. There's no one telling you what to do. Hey, and Teresa, are you now ready for the lightning round? I am ready. All right. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? I think the best piece of advice I've ever received is really to surround yourself with people who are going to lift you up. You can keep an inner circle of people who fit this description And sometimes in life, there are people close to us who don't lift us up. Just know they can be close to you, but you don't have to invite them into your inner circle. Yeah, and I'll say what I've heard from multiple podcasts that I've listened to is you are the average of the five people you hang out with. So surround yourself with people that will lift you up. If you're hanging out with some people that, you know, aren't doing maybe what you think is right, You may have to think about that and make some choices, maybe some hard choices, and change your circle of friends. So thanks for that, Teresa. That's very important and very popular advice. So Teresa, what's a personal habit that contributes to your success? We've said it already many times, even just in this podcast, and that's always be learning. Technology is changing so fast. You need to stay up to date in your area. And then Explore skills that you need to explore. Maybe we talked about this too, some of the soft skills, maybe communications or relationship building or leadership. Make sure you mix some of those in as well. And what is your favorite internet resource or phone app and why? So I actually had some trouble with this question, um, but my answer will be uh, LinkedIn is certainly important for networking. And then I actually love the Merriam-Webster website, m-w.com, because I'm always looking for the right word, and I want to make sure I'm using the right word. So that's a website that I often visit. All right. And what is one book you recommend and why? I know you only asked for one. I'm going to give you three. And the first one changed my life. It's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And even though it's over 25 years old, I've read it several times since then. I'm actually reading it right now. And I always find relevant information. And not only do I always find relevant information, I find new information in it. Things that strike me now that didn't strike me before as relevant. And so it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. I I highly recommend everyone read this. And if you're entering into college, this is a great time to read this book. I want to stop you right there because Karen Bartleson, the IEEE CEO and president, that is the book that she recommended as well. So I'm going to say right now, STEM Nation, head on over to stemonfirebook.com because Audible is offering a free audiobook with 30-day trial and you can cancel after 30 days and you can get The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People on audio and that is a book that you should listen to over and over and over and over because depending upon where you are in your life and your season in life, you're only going to be able to pick up certain things from that book. You'll listen to it again six months or a year from now, and you're going to find things in that book that you didn't even realize existed there. That is a lifelong learning book. So thank you for that, Teresa. And you have two more books, right? I do. If you're interested in becoming a leader that grows leaders and runs a productive and effective team, then I have two books for you. The first one is Turn the Ship Around, The True Story of Turning Followers into Leaders by David Marquet. Uh, David Marquet was a former captain of a nuclear submarine. It's very interesting. And then a new book that just came out called Never Boss, Great Leadership by Letting Go by Kevin Crenshaw. Teresa, and as we wrap up here, can you share a parting piece of guidance for STEM Nation? And then we'll say goodbye. STEM Nation, I want everyone listening to this podcast to know you have more potential than you can even imagine. And I'd like to leave you with a quote from the late Dr. Wayne Dyer. He said, take constructive action toward implementing your inner intuitive inclinations. So let me read that one more time. Take constructive action 
toward implementing your inner intuitive inclination. So listen to your inner voice, Damnation, and I wish you all the best. All right. Thank you, Teresa. And with that, we'll say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today with Teresa. Head on over to stemonfire.com, subscribe to the email list to keep up with the latest happenings, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. Tune in next week where we talk with Amanda, who is an RF, or radio frequency engineer. Until next time, I hope this chat has helped ignite your passion towards a STEM career.